Chapter 4 The mansion was in havoc. Lady Lalita and her husband had rushed home from the military event upon hearing the bad news, and the mother fainted after reading the letter left by her son before he vanished into thin air. The general called out for a maid to bring an herbal inhaler for his wife. Soon, a security guard walked in to give them a report. I've checked the security footages at the gates and the fences. The cameras were disconnected at around midnight, as if someone had planned to do so, sir. The task was a piece of cake for a culprit who happened to be a mechanical engineer student like his son. The former general pinched his throbbing temples when his wife, who came to, started wailing. Why did you do this? The end. You could have told us what you wanted. We can give you anything. There's nothing we wouldn't do for you. Tears ran down the mother's chubby face. The young man had just told her, the night before, that he wouldn't hurt her, and here she was, crying out for him as if her heart was breaking into pieces. Calm down, my love. Everything's gonna be okay. Our son's a grown-up man. He's physically grown up, but not mentally. An adult wouldn't do this to his parents. He could have told us the truth. Lady Lalita retorted, upset by her youngest son's behavior. The general let out a long, heavy sigh and sat down before his wife. Because he knew that had he asked, you wouldn't let him go. Am I such an irrational person? She cast a distressed glance at him. You're a woman of reasons except when it comes to Theon, the former general said matter-of-factly. When you learned that he had a heart condition, you were all over him like a mother hen. That's why he was acting out. After the surgery, you still put restrictions on him, not letting him out of the house and see the world without your permission. He was recovering and not a prisoner, said the general. Tears ran down her face at the last sentence. You're saying it's my fault? That I'm being protective of our son? It's not your fault, but overdoing it can be negative. That's why Lord Buddha said that the middle way is the correct path. Not too much, not too little. And your life would be peaceful and content. The end said in the letter he wanted to search for happiness. I don't get it. He has his house, his car, and all the money he could ask for. He had everything handed to him. What else does he want? The general smiled lightly. That's what we call happiness, but to him it must be something different. As a military officer who served his country, the general was content that his youngest son took the courage to break away from his comfort zone, to face the wild world, and that he wasn't being confined in the extravagance his mother had showered on him. Yet, his main concern was, where was it that his son planned to go and whether he was safe? The former general called his subordinate, who was still active in the military unit, and asked him to investigate his son's disappearance immediately. Once the end's motive was known, and if it proved to be harmless, he would send someone to watch over him from afar, so that the young man would be able to experience life as he intended to. After he succeeded in calming down his wife and accompanied her upstairs to rest, he returned to the first floor and picked up the letter again. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm writing this letter with a heavy heart, but please know that this is not me running away from home. After my miraculous arrival, I began to see the world upside down. All my life I've felt hallowed inside, and I don't know what it is that I really want. I just want to see what others always talk about. I never knew the things they knew. I guess what I want to say is that it's not a reckless act. Please don't look for me. When the time comes, I'll be back. Please don't be worried. Love you both so much. Then. The former general silently folded the paper in his hand. He only wished that his youngest son would soon find the answer that he was looking for. 
The bus shook as it ran along a train track and the man who was leaning against the window woke up from the vibration. The sun was streaming through the gap between the thick curtains. Dian yawned widely then looked at his wristwatch. The hand struck at two. He fished out his cell phone from the jeans back pocket out of habit and found that there was no incoming call. It was supposed to be so. He had deactivated all the tracking apps that could trace him down and changed a new SIM card so no one would be able to reach him and ask him to come home. The wealthy young man moved his joints, feeling cramped. He had lost his balance when he jumped over the fence out of his mansion and walked to the main road at 3 a.m. Turned out getting a taxi at that hour was a bad idea, and by the time he made it to the bus station, he almost missed the bus. Then lifted the water bottle to his lips and drank, then pried the curtains open to look at the countryside. He didn't know if people back home were aware of his disappearance yet. If they did, he hoped they would respect his written wish. The first class, air-conditioned bus, took a turn and stopped at a gas station for the passengers to get out of the bus to relax and use the toilets. Even if the bus took ten times longer than an airplane, it was much harder to track down. The end was certain no one would expect a spoiled brat like him to choose this more difficult route. In a few hours, he would reach the intercity bus station in Chang'ai. Thrill ran all over him once he had thought about it. From what he knew, the village that was his destination was in a military protected area, guarded by a barrack at the borders. It took a complicated winding route to reach there. The barrack had agreed to send a soldier to pick him up and look after his journey. The bus's engine roared up again signaling to all passengers to return to their seats. A few minutes later, the big bus was on a highway, heading towards the destination without any stops. By 4.5pm, the vehicle arrived on time to the main station in Chang'ai. Dian grabbed his backpack from the overhead rack, slung it on his shoulder and got down the bus. He looked around in bewilderment at the unfamiliar territory and decided to follow the other passengers. The main bus station was vast, with an open high roof. All of the long benches were occupied by commuters who put bags and reed baskets filled with fruits around their feet. He saw an old, tough-looking jeep with a governmental license plate in front of the station, and didn't know if it was the one sent for him, because there was no driver in sight. The slender man put down his heavy backpack and leaned against the pole to look up the numbers of the foundation staff, who was his emergency contact. He jumped when a voice came up behind him. Are you the teacher from Song Tong Foundation? Being called a teacher, the man who thought of himself as a fake gave out a dry smile. Just call me Thien, please. He greeted the soldier in green t-shirt and camouflage pants, who was just a little younger than his father. Yes, Kru, Dian. Still, the man called him a teacher. I'm Staff Sergeant Yod. You can call me Yod. The soldier introduced himself with a provincial tang in his accent. Is that all the gear you got? Come on, let me help you. Dian didn't stop the man from taking his backpack and put it in the back of the jeep because he was used to someone serving him. He got into the car that had no window pane. The veteran jeep's engine was ignited with a roar and rolled into the street. It was a military vehicle with a single canvas as a roof, letting the wind in with a loud noise. Tien lifted his hand to wipe away the beads of sweat that ran down his forehead and seeped around his hairline. Yod let out a laugh. It's hot now, but you wait till you are uphill. I promise you'll search for a blanket. I won't be sleeping at the barrack, will I? He asked, because the foundation staff had told him that he would be staying in a house, but they didn't say where. Your house is in the village. The barrack is uphill, three kilometers away. Dian nodded and listened to the senior staff sergeant tell about the village that they would reach within two hours. Fab Pando is a tiny village out of Aula'aka Hill Tribe, who had settled on Thai soil for generations. Their descendants now have Thai citizenship. 
In the past, they made a living out of opium trade. Once eradicated, our royal father had sent someone to teach them how to make a different kind of living. So now they grow tea, coffee, and winter flowers. When we're in the area, just look over the ridges and you'll see the plantation terraces. An hour later, the Yip arrived at the narrow dirt road flanked by dense trees. Yod told the younger man that this bumpy path was collaboration between the soldiers and the villagers who covered the soil together years ago. Even if it was just a road made of rock and compressed soil, it shortened the travels uphill and downhill. The sun that was setting against the horizon made the temperature lowered. The end curled up on the passenger seat from the coal, listening to the hum of an Isan traditional song, Jod's hometown, with cricket sounds until the jeep took a turn and came to a halt at a curb. Kurtian, it's time to take a hike. Jod gave him a broad smile. A hike? The end forced out a smile. How far is it going to be? Not that far. I took you along the detour to the end of the village because your house is right over there. If I stopped in the front, then it's five kilometers on foot. From here, it's just two. An easy walk. Easy, my ass. The volunteer teacher, who had never experienced any hardship in his life, glared at the soldier. He normally drove his car if the distance was more than 50 meters. Now he had to hike up a steep hill with a big backpack for kilometers? Jod saw the younger man's sour look and blurted out. It's going to be a bit steep over there. He volunteered to take the backpack and all the younger man had to carry was a flashlight. The sky was turning dark. The soldier led the way, pacing hurriedly before the reptilian world would come to life. Tien cast a light from the lamp as big as his palm to the ground before them and saw a steep path that led to a narrow passage into the village. Luckily, he had started working out, following the surgeon's advice, and he would definitely make it. Jod pointed towards a hut in a shade ten meters away. The wealthy young man was bending over his knees, panting. We're almost there. Hold on. The man in front shouted, showing no signs of fatigue despite his age. Tien rose to inhale the cool air into his lungs and marched on. The smell of burnt woods, accompanied by white smoke, reached them. He looked for the origin and spotted a simple makeshift fireplace, rocks that formed a circle with woods on top of them, now burnt black that created a bright flame in the middle of the darkness right in front of the old hut. A long shadow cast out from the hut caught his eye. He followed it until he saw a tall, muscular figure, a man who stood with his arms crossed, looking away from the hut, as if in reverie. Even if he wasn't carrying a rifle or wearing a uniform, Tien recognized the broad shoulders that looked like a solid rock cliff right away. The flashlight fell from his slender hand with a loud clang. The light was killed and the face in the shadow turned towards him in darkness. The ends was riveted by an intense stare and the world stood still, except for his heart that was thundering and spreading the pang across his chest. Then the new volunteer teacher slumped to the ground, but before he knocked himself out, the officer rushed in and grabbed him, putting his arm around the thin waist. Tien's smooth cheek touched the broad, strong chest, even more solid than he'd imagined. But once he realized he was cradled in another man's arms, his face turned red-hot. The wealthy young man kept his eyes shut with a deep frown, unable to stop his errant heart from thundering against his ribcage. Are you all right? Hearing a deep voice next to his ears, Tien jumped and pushed the man away sending himself to the ground. Teacher! Jod rushed in but didn't forget to salute his commanding officer. He then pulled the thin arm and helped the end to his feet. The young man brushed the dirt from his jeans and glanced towards the young, tall, muscular officer. Damn you, giant. How could the man let him fall on his butt like that? I'm okay. He turned to tell Jod, who gave him a worried look. Well then, Kruthian, 
Jod spread his hand towards the troop's commanding officer, who remained expressionless. This is Captain Fufa, the commanding officer of the 3307th Infantry, Fa Fra Piron Operation Base. The end pressed his lips in frustration that the handsome face was glaring at him as if he was a nuisance. Do I have to salute you as well? The sarcasm rolled off his tongue, but the other man seemed to be unperturbed. No need to. Just to have by is enough. It was Dien's turn to be speechless. He reluctantly lifted his hand to Vi, the other man. Yod saw the awkward exchange and jumped in. Captain, Crew Dien will take Crew Ad's place. He referred to the previous volunteer teacher, who lasted only three weeks before giving up and packing his bags to leave this harsh place. The young officer nodded in acknowledgement and pointed towards the hut. Leave your belongings there. You have all the necessities that I've arranged for you. He stopped and continued with the words that made Thien want to kick him. I hope you know how to use them. Is there a manual? Thien retorted. Just some simple gears. If you don't know how to work with them, I'll have someone bring you the manual. The officer's voice was so solemn that he couldn't tell if the man had aimed for sarcasm. Thank you. The end chose to let it slide, not wanting a verbal duel with the massive officer. He took the backpack that Sergeant Jod handed to him with a dry smile and stormed off towards the elevated bamboo hut with the thatched roof. Jod saw how the end was struggling to use the broken stairs and turned to the officer. You still haven't told any army engineer to fix them? I've been busy with the loggers the past few days, so it slipped my mind. Fufa answered impassively and paused. I don't think we have to. He won't be staying for long. Don't judge a book by its cover, Captain. Kruad looked like a tank, just like the rest of the villagers, and he couldn't make it. The commissioned officer let out a long sigh. His sharp eyes were filled with heavy emotion, as if he had something on his mind that couldn't be shared with others. You think the boy who just hit his puberty dressed in expensive clothes from head to toes will make it through the semester? It's three months, he emphasized. The sergeant chuckled sheepishly. He better keep his mouth shut on the matter. Um, how did you get here, though? I parked the jeep at the end of the entrance. With a motorcycle barred from the base? Even if the route was winding, rough, and steep, it wasn't something someone who already had lived there for four years couldn't manage. Do you want to go back together? Riding at night is dangerous. It's fine. I'm used to it. See you at the base, Sergeant. Fufa abruptly ended the conversation and walked to straddle over the vehicle. He started the engine and rode off against the cool wind. Then... He stepped on the brake as if something just came to him. He hadn't told the new teacher what tomorrow's task would be. Forget about it. The young man didn't appear to be a morning person, so once he finished with the morning inspection routine, he could come by the hut later. Making up his mind, the officer sped up and headed towards the base that was three kilometers away. The small bamboo hut was sectioned into an empty rectangular living space and a narrow balcony. Thien looked for sockets in the dark before remembering that electricity and pipe water didn't work at this location. How could the villagers survive? He placed the backpack in a corner and caught a glimpse of a big kerosene lantern. The youngest son of an influential military officer sat down cross-legged and lifted the lantern to inspect under the moonlight that streamed into the hut. He noticed that there was an inscription in English in tiny letters across the other end of the base that bore the lamb's brand name. He looked around for the flashlight before realizing that he had dropped it outside. He didn't bother to pick it up, so he grabbed the cell phone that became useless due to the lack of signals and turned on the flashlight function. Squinting his eyes to read the tiny words, his sockets became sore even if he'd never used such a device in his everyday life, he wasn't so dumb and unable to use it. There was an instruction written on the lamp, after all. 
He put the lamp on the floor made of bamboo strips and turned the base until he found a plastic hand pump. He pushed it in and out ten times, turned on the burner and twisted the fuel tank cap to the right. Seconds later, a big flame flared up, making him jump. After a minute, the flame didn't dim and Thien was afraid he'd burn down the hut. He reached out reluctantly and twisted the fuel cap to the left. The flame dimmed and looked safe. The city boy touched his chest, relieved, and moved the lamp to the wall so it wouldn't stand in his way in the tiny hut. Looking around, he spotted a small writing desk, an old mattress, a tender blanket, a cotton pillow with a hole, and a grayish mosquito net on the floor. Luckily, the floor and the walls were clean and dust-free. He guessed someone had cleaned the hut before he arrived. The young man wrapped his arms around his knees for a while, sitting and not knowing where to start, and decided to start with hanging the net. Even if he had been in reserved officer's training corps in high school, he was sleeping in a tent, or using a canvas as a roof. The young man clumsily unfolded the greyish-white net. There were strings on all four ends, so he guessed he could hook them with something. He looked up at the poles and the walls and found some loose nails. Tian wrapped the strings around them and finished with a flabby, uneven net. He let out a heavy sigh and slumped to the floor, exhausted. His stomach growled, breaking the silence as a reminder that he hadn't eaten anything solid since noon. The shapely eyebrows knitted in frustration, thinking of the tall, massive officer. Why would he come to see him empty-handed? Couldn't he have brought some food along with him, too? As the wealthy young man lazily crawled towards his backpack, remembering that he had cereal bars, his eyes caught a glimpse of a three-tiered stainless steel tiffin box, or pinto, and a bottle of water near the doorframe that he hadn't seen at first. The end swallowed thickly, realizing that he had misjudged and cussed out Crew Torfin's beloved captain. Yet, he shrugged nonchalantly. The man didn't hear a thing, anyway. He reached toward the food carrier, starved, and once he opened it, he found omelette, clear soup with egg, tofu, and rice that had already turned cold. How did Captain Fufa know that he didn't eat spicy food? Might be a pure guess or whatever, but his stomach was digesting itself with the gastric juice. He no longer cared if the food in front of him would be drenched in spices. He was going to devour it anyway. If someone who knew Thien, a young master who only dined at five-star restaurants, was seeing him right now, the person would be in shock to see how he was using a sink spoon to munch on dry rice. When someone was hungry, even the saddest, driest omelette was delicious. Even the clear soup that barely had any meat became a real treat. Thien finished up the food, leaving no single rice in the carrier, and gulped on the water. I'm so freaking full right now, he let out a remark in the empty hut. Then he started taking out his belongings from the backpack. Tien wanted to take a shower before bed, but it was late, and he didn't know where the bathroom was. His slender hand stopped mid-track as he pulled out a small bottle of shower cream. Captain Fufa and Sergeant Jod hadn't told him anything about the bathroom, and it would be senseless to look for one in the middle of the night, especially when the hut was surrounded by woods. So, he lay down to sleep, unwashed. Thien carried the mattress and laid it out inside the net. The musty smell reeking off the mattress stopped him from lying down, but he couldn't sleep in a sitting position, could he? closed his eyes and dropped himself down, putting his head on the hard rectangular pillow. Staring up at the flame reflection on the ceiling, he reached for his cell phone out of habit and remembered there was no cellular or internet signal. He threw the phone that had become a pricey paperweight on his side and let out a long sigh for the hundredth time. Crickets and insects chimed in with the cold breeze that blew silence and solitude into the hut. Tears welled up in the old man's eyes. What are you doing here, Thien? Late morning came, and the sun was shining over the complex mountain ranges. Yet, 
The young man who fell asleep in the clothes he'd been wearing the day before still curled up inside the flappy net. A tall figure in a greenish khaki t-shirt bearing an emblem of a royal crown with a ray over a rowel on the left chest and a camouflage pants stood with hands on his hips, dismayed at the sight of the new teacher who was still sound asleep. The captain put down the flashlight that the city boy had dropped on the ground and cast his eyes towards the burn-out kerosene lantern. The fuel cap that had been left on halfway let him know that the lantern had worked on all night and exhausted the oil. Even if the boy wasn't so dumb, knowing how to make the lantern work and taking care of himself, he was still careless to leave the lamp on. Perhaps the hut had to burn down before he'd realized that the device required benzene, not battery, to make it work. Fufa took in a deep breath and chanted Buddha in his mind to calm himself down. He reached out to lift the four ends of the net, then crouched down to shake the boy who was hugging himself in his sleep. Dian, wake up. The young man, who was being roused, turned on his side in annoyance. The captain frowned and bent down to whisper not too gently next to one white ear. If you love your easy life so much, why bother coming here to be a volunteer teacher? Why don't you run back home to your warm, nice bed? Tian sprang up in sitting position once he realized he was no longer in his own bedroom in Bangkok. His nose almost touched the officer's rough cheek. Did he touch him? He didn't, did he? The handsome face reddened like a cherry while the other man remained impassive. The young military officer slowly rose to his feet, stretching up to his full height, and spoke in an authoritative voice as if giving a command to his subordinate. Get up and take a bath. The wealthy city boy rubbed his face to brush away the embarrassment and raised his voice in defiance. I know, I know. Where's the bathroom, anyway? You didn't say a word about it, and I had to sleep in this smelly clothes. Not far from here, but you'd better not go in there at night. If you need a toilet, there's a latrine at the back of the hut. I've walled it up for you. Dian couldn't imagine what a latrine looked like, but anything that allowed him to relieve himself would do. He fetched his belongings from the backpack. The unpacking left unfinished and held them in his hands. Fufa looked at the clothes, a bar of soap and a toothbrush in the new volunteer teacher's hands. Follow me, he said brusquely. Dian rushed off after the imposing officer. Once an order was issued, Fufa briskly turned and stormed off. The sun was blasting outside and it hurt his eyes, but he finally saw Fa Pandao village in full view. The villagers lived only ten meters away from his hut, and their houses looked similar to his except for the sizes. The city boy looked at the people and the children in peculiar colorful local costumes. Some of them wore normal clothes, so he assumed that the community had taken on the modern world's influences and mixed other cultures with their own. This was why they were open to and encouraged education, comparing to other villages that still clung to their own tribal identities. Tian was nervous. Wherever he turned, all eyes were on him as if he was a monster. Once he looked back at them, they looked down with a sheepy smile. Then Captain Fufa stopped in front of the biggest house in the vicinity. Is this where the bathroom is? Tian asked. No. Fufa was economical with his answer as usual. Wait here till I return. He strode on the stairs to the second floor, leaving the younger man in a shade in front of the house. Soon the captain returned with an elderly man who had an air of kindness around him. Dian, meet Uncle Bieng Lair. He's the leader and the village chief. You can call him Kama. Dian raised his hands to perform a vie. He knew how to keep his manners, after all. Greetings. Greetings to you, too, teacher. How was your sleep? The man who was the Kama, or the wise one, who acted as a bridge between the village and the outside world, replied in central Thai dialect, with a tang of his native accent. It was fine, but there were 
too many mosquitoes. The ant rubbed his arm that bore many bite marks. That was because you didn't tug in the ends of the net. Captain Fufa cut in, irking the younger man. That was because I didn't know how to use it. You said you'd bring me the manual. The captain went silent and uttered with an absolute seriousness the way he did last night. My apology. I didn't know that you really needed it. Tien's thin lip formed a mischievous grin. You don't need to write one for me. Just spare a little bit of your time to teach me would do. All right, then. I'll come to see you at the hut this evening. Fufa said. It was Tien's turn to be stunned. What kind of man are you? But before another bout of verbal ping-pong could start, Uncle Byung Lair thrust the plastic ball at the new teacher. You better hurry up to take a bath. It'll be too hot by noon. Tian took the ball, bewildered, as he saw a black chunk of something and a plastic bottle filled with brown liquid. What are these? Bamboo, charcoal soap, and soapberry herbal shampoo. The shapely eyebrows cocked, as if to ask why he needed them. He brought his own personal care products. Once you reach the bathroom, you'll know. The captain answered, the corner of his mouth lifted into a light smile, amused for what was about to happen. Both men bowed farewell to the village leader and walked on. The scorching sun turned Tien's fair skin red, and he was wiping the sweats from his forehead and neck and staring at the tall man's solid back under the tight t-shirt as the captain strode in front of him, with no signs of exhaustion. It finally got on Thien's nerves. Why did you have to build a bathroom so far away from the hut? You're going to be drenched in sweat on your way back. The captain heard a low whine, but said nothing as he pointed a finger towards a spot in a spare forest not far away. Thien's eyes followed and his mouth was agape. He sprinted past the officer and stopped in front of a wide creek that laid below a cascade from a steep cliff. The waterfall was crystal clear, so clear that he saw fallen leaves on the bottom of the water. The city boy turned pale. He turned around, facing the young captain that stopped next to him. Where's the bathroom? He knew he was asking the stupidest question since the answer was right before his eyes. Here's your natural bathroom. Fufa emphasized. You want me to strip and bathe here? Not in a million years. There's another option. You can borrow a bucket and a wooden beam from a villager and fill the water from the creek in the earthen jar behind your hut. Tien didn't back down from the captain's intense glare as if wanting to shout his protest. Are you freaking kidding me? It seemed Fufa received the silent message. I'm not kidding. He nodded in affirmation. You have to take the water back to your hut if you want to use it. No exceptions even for the villagers. You don't have groundwater? Groundwater wells existed all over the countryside, did it not? The officer who had skipped his duty to play babysitter for this troublesome city boy shook his head, feeling fed up. The budget ran out once it reached the foot of the hill. He was referring to the vultures that had snatched their sums long before the money was funneled into real development projects. How does your remote barrack survive then? The military has its own budget. We've got a groundwater well and electricity from the generator at Fa Fa Piron operating base. The ant snorted and grumbled, annoyed. That's not fair. What do you want? The young captain asked in a stern voice. I don't have the whole day to babysit you. The new volunteer teacher pressed his lips, fingers gripping tight on the plastic bowl. He was torn between two choices. It was harder than choosing between Gucci, sunglasses, and Todd's loafers. After a careful consideration, he gritted his teeth. I'll bathe right here. Use the charcoal soap and the herbal shampoo that I've asked Uncle Byung Lair to give his share to you. Famuk Waterfall is the natural water resource that feeds the whole village. Don't contaminate it with the chemical substances and the products you brought. 
Tien glanced at the herbal goods in the plastic bowl and sneered with disgust. The soap was blackened and the shampoo looked like feces. How could the captain expect him to clean himself with these? Captain Fufa frowned in dismay. Do not underestimate the folk wisdom that's been passed on for generation. Herbs are proven to be a good as modern product. I know, I know. The wealthy young man waved his hand to dismiss the captain's remark and halted mid-air as if something came to him. I'm going to get naked in the stream. I hope you're not thinking of keeping an eye on me. I am? Fifa answered in a firm voice. You haven't been officially introduced by the village chief, so you're still an outsider. If you commit a wrongdoing against someone's daughter, I would be... in a deep shit. He swallowed the last words as the city boy went on with his retort as if he didn't hear a thing. Look, Cap. I'm a guy just like you. True. But you're neither my friend nor cousin. I can't be bare-ass in front of you. You might not be embarrassed, but I am. The young captain tried his best to understand the rich prude's logic and decided to extend his courtesy. All right, I'll look away. Just get on with it. I'm extremely grateful to you. The end shot him a sarcastic remark, his eyes following the tall captain who walked towards the tree to sit down under the canopy, not too far away. He turned to busy himself with a heavy sigh. The stench that clung on the clothes made him strip the t-shirt with bright graphic prints and the skinny jeans off. He left his underwear on as he didn't have enough guts to stand naked and offended the forest and mountains guardian spirits. A warm breeze and a plume of heat from the sunlight touched his skin until it turned red. The sweat on his joints made him feel itchy. The end stepped on the rocks on the water and used the plastic bowl to scoop up the water. He held his breath as he rubbed the dark charcoal soap on his skin. The sweet jasmine scent that touched his nostrils made the wealthy man, who had never used plain soap, lift the bar with grey bubbles to sniff. Not bad, it actually smells nice. The end poured the brown liquid from the plastic bottle and found out that it wasn't made of buffalo dung as he'd thought. The slender hands rubbed vigorously on the scalps until the shampoo got into his eyes. The cool stream around his waist gave him an urge to roll sideways and fall into the deeper basin next to him. The bubbles clung to the fair slender figure that happily dived up and down the water, forgetting how he had despised everything on this unfamiliar territory. The man who sat under the tree looked at his watch, realizing that he'd deserted his duty for far too long. The captain rose to his feet, brushing off the dirt from his camouflage pants and walking back to the spot he had been earlier. He saw the worn clothes next to the new ones on the rock, but the man who should have been here was nowhere in sight. Fufa looked around for the young troublemaker and saw that the guy was swimming under the cascade that thundered from the ridge. Dien, stop. There's a whirlpool right there, he shouted. The cascade's force that hit the basin had created a whirlpool underneath. He didn't know if the brat heard him, but Thien was disappearing right before his eyes, without any signs of struggle. A millisecond later, the young captain was pulling out his combat boots. Fuck. The loud curse rang through the woods, followed by a big splash of water. Fufa dived down and found the city boy lying face down at the bottom of the waterfall. Once he reached out to grab the slim waist, the young man started struggling, his arm flailing and poking in the captain's face, prompting him to choke on the water. Fufa reached out to grasp the trashing limbs, but the end was throwing his arms around his neck and locked him into a tight grip. The young captain thrust upwards over the surface with a vengeance spirit plastered to his back. He turned sharply to glare at the boy who was resting his chin on the broad shoulder. A sweet herbal shampoo scent that lingered in the air made him come self-conscious and aware how close they were. So close that the tips of their noses almost touched. Fufa raked his eyes from the chin to look into the gorgeous pair of eyes that were shown with mischief and felt his blood pressure rise. He took a deep breath to quench his simmering anger. 
You tricked me. The deep voice emphasized each word. Tien's rosy lips formed a big smile, the kind of smile that could blind. I really have a cramp, with or without the whirlpool. You're right. The captain's slur was dripped with sarcasm as he looked at the younger man who was trying not to laugh. Still, a soft chuckle slipped out. Tien smiled, pleased that he pranked the tall, massive captain to be drenched. He clung like a leech as the other man waded through the water until they reached the shore. Get off. Fufa gave a dismissive order and was about to climb on the shore, but the end tugged at his t-shirt with a fake sad expression. But I can't feel my legs. Fufa narrowed his eyes, then he bent over and put his arms under the brat's knees and scooped him up in a bridal style. One long stride from the powerful legs and they were up on the shore with the captain, holding the half-naked and stricken young man in his strong arms. The heart was racing like mad, pumping the blood to Thien's reddened cheeks as he felt his male dignity vanish into thin air. He didn't know if he could be furious or ashamed, and started hitting the thick chest with his fists, shouting, You prick, let go of me! Well, you said you can't feel your legs, didn't you? I'm going to carry you home. Isn't that what you wanted? The intense eyes that looked at the end meant business. Being carried like a bride? In underwear? What the hell is up with the captain? Tian threw his arms around the strong neck, pulling the other man down, and shouted into his ear, I'm fine! Let go of me! All of a sudden, the young captain dropped the slender form down, and Thien almost lost his balance. He glared vehemently at the handsome face, unaware that Fufa was staring at the long scar in the middle of his chest. Yet, the young officer chose not to comment on it. He bent down to pick up the towel and threw it at the naked man. Dry yourself, and get dressed. What about you? Thien felt a nagging sense of guilt seeing how the captain's green t-shirt and camouflage pants were soaking and dripping. I'm okay. Once I take you back to the village, I'll return to the camp. Fufa said dismissively and told the other man to hurry up. The wealthy young man turned his back to the captain and quickly put on his dry clothes. His lips trembling and his body shivering. As they headed back towards the village, side by side, he stole glances at the dark handsome face the authentic Thai male beauty, and thought about handing the towel to the captain. Yet, he stopped himself. Why is his heart quivering inside his chest? Stop confusing me, Thorfinn. 